Well, it's great to be here. Uh, this is a nice town. I could just, you know, I drove in and thought, this is a nice place to live. So I thought, you know, being from California, I think I should probably, no, I won't do that. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, there's a lot of us moving out of California, moving to these wonderful, precious towns uh, in uh, the Midwest and in Tennessee and uh, Texas and uh, so it's an interesting, uh, it's, it's a great place, a great place. I also want you guys to know how blessed you are to have your pastor, because on to every man and answer, there's been uh, times when he, he'll give an answer, it'll be out of revelations and, or something, it'll be a real detailed answer, and then he'll be real polite and courteous and say, you know, so Brad, what are, you, what are your thoughts? What do you think? And I'm like, well, I think you actually, I think you answered it perfectly. Uh, <laughs> I, I think that was a great answer. And uh, so anyway, but it, it's, it's a real blessing, actually, to the... Uh, and the other, the other host on the for to every man and answer, I'm like I'm really humbled, really humbled to uh, to be able to participate. So uh, let's uh, let's pray, uh, Father. We thank you, Lord, so much that you you love us, Father, right where we are, um, because of who you are and because of uh, what you did on the cross through your Son Jesus Christ, uh, dying for our sins and rising again. Father, we pray. For your Holy Spirit this morning, Lord, uh, just to speak to us in your word. This is, it's not my word, it's, it's not the pastor's word, Lord. This is your word from your scripture that you have given us. Father, we pray for your Holy Spirit to, to speak to us and to repair us and to, uh, to guide us now. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Um, well, how many of you at times in life have felt that you were not fully equipped? You know, like... Like, okay, here's a classic example. Like, well, you know, what, what happens in life when, when everything is really smooth and you're finally on cruise control and everything is finally like, okay, now things are all right, things are good. What, what happens? Suddenly, a big cow gets in the middle of the road and you have to go left or right, have lots of hamburger meat. You know that line works much better in Texas, but anyway, so, so but that's what happened to me. So I was sitting here. All right, I was, everything was going really smooth. And um, here's what happened. I was back, it was 1997, and I was the uh, Western Regional Coordinator for the Rutherford Institute. I opened an office for them five years prior to that and in Sacra, Sacramento, California. And, and after five years, I built it up and built a network of attorneys in 14 states and coordinated about 40% of all their active litigation. I was finally at this point like, okay, things are really smooth now. It's like... And then I get a call from the, the uh, John Whitehead saying, Brad, uh, we have to close the last regional offices, including yours. But don't worry. Um, we don't want to let you go. So we want, I want you to promote you. I want you to head up our public affairs office in Washington, D.C. You have a, a, a higher salary, larger staff. Uh, you'll be the, the face of the organization for all media in all cases. You represent us at the, state, at the U.S. Capitol. Um, and I thought, wow, no, that's... I can't enough to really pray about this because obviously God's closing one door and opening another one, and when that happens, you don't have to bother praying. <laughs> so I had insomnia, and I couldn't sleep, still couldn't sleep, still couldn't sleep. Finally, finally I said to myself, oh, shoot, i got to pray. <laughs> now, why did I not want to pray? I'm going to be honest with you. I didn't want to pray because when I get in these forks in the road and there's the easy way, then there's this other way requiring faith. Guess which way I'm convicted? It's almost always this more difficult thing requiring faith. And, and that's what happened here. So I, I prayed, and, 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 and uh, as soon as I did, the Lord hit me over the head uh, with the basic question, which is, Brad, what desires have I put on your heart? Just like, kaboom. And... The answer was to make sure people get the help they need where it's needed most, here on the West Coast. The next question was, what do you choose to follow? The desires are putting your heart or something else. Like my obsession with security. And because uh, I love security. And my utopia job, just from the flesh, is to be the legal counsel for Procter & Gamble. <laughs> most stable company, stable position, and have everyone in the company totally dependent on me so I can never get fired. Very different. Than, than starting a nonprofit. I mean, just from the get-go, when you're an entrepreneur starting a nonprofit, it's a self-determined de loss. I mean, it's, it's nonprofit. I mean, anyway. So, 
nonetheless, um, I felt convicted, so I said, okay, with boldness and courage, Lord, yes, I will rise to the call. I will rise to the challenge. I will follow you faithfully. I will, on several conditions. <laughs> now, this is just what I said. It doesn't sound really good, but it's just, you know, God takes us where we are, folks. Isn't this awesome? God just takes us where we are. Sometimes we may say to ourselves, well, if the Lord knew how afraid I was, Lord, yeah, he does know. So just be honest, right? God wants us to be honest. Uh, you know, it's interesting. Uh, let me ask you this question. Where do you go um, when you w- really want to, when you're you know, discouraged and you just really want to be encouraged? Where do the Bible usually go to, to be uplifted? What, what book of the Bible usually? Psalms. Psalms, right? So you go to the book of Psalms, you go, let's see, all right, oh, yeah, ooh, ooh, ooh not this one. Not this one. <laughs> ooh, ooh, not this one, not this one. Oh, this one, this one. We're all guilty of being psalm flippers. Now, you may not admit it, but it's true. We're all psalm flippers. Why are we psalm flippers? Because David was a man for God's own heart. Now, David David had a track record. The guy sinned, right? I mean, blatantly. And I love scriptures, the the honesty of it, because it just is just right there. And yet, David was a man for God's own heart. David was honest and open with God. And you see it in the psalms. And the same way, God wants us to be that way with him because he takes us right where we are. Isn't that great? Right where we are. He knows us inside and out. So like a a little two-and-a-half-year-old, three-year-old, and they're like, you say, don't, don't touch that, don't touch that, don't touch that, and they're, don't touch, I mean, it's like, we know. We know, you know. So if those of you have little kids, you'll know what I'm talking about. It's just like that. It's always that testing thing, phase they go through, um, and hopefully get out of someday. So anyway. But um, anyway, so I, I was honest with God, and I says, God, I just want to make sure this is absolutely for me. So I gave a few little requirements. I had to well, big requirements. I have to have free office space donated in Sacramento indefinitely, free. Uh, comp- free computer system. Key me on the radio stations for free. There were two at the time. And um, we have to be in the Black God in just three months. And um, I'm not going to get into debt. So, and also, just so you know, um, I'm not going to. We're I'm not going to charge anyone any time for any work we ever do. I thought it was very reasonable with my business model. <laughs> and and uh, God has an interesting way of working. Um, when I was, we were shutting down the Rutherford office, and uh, it was interesting. We we're shutting down the Rutherford office, and we have one of in the last month, and it's going to be shut down, and then. And I didn't tell anyone about my need for free office space. I thought, I don't have to. I told God. And if, this is by, if God's behind it, he'll give me the office space. I don't have to tell anyone. That, did I have an attitude? OK, I had an attitude. But God deals with people like me. So I, get, I, I answer the, fo- the phone. My secretary sends me the call in, Pamela. And I answer the phone. I said, yes, hello. He goes, yes, I heard you needed free office space. I have free office space for you. Now, was I, oh, thank the Lord, God, you're so, no. I was. How'd you know I need office space? <laughs> you know, because I, I don't know, my mind, I mean, I had this kind of a Jonah attitude. I had my bags packed in the boat, fleeing it of a, I mean, I think that was sort of my mindset. Because um, I was so scared. Anyway, he goes, and I said, my secretary, here's my tone. You know, she goes, well, put him on hold, put him on hold. He goes, yes, can I put you on hold? Okay, great, yes, yes, what, Pamela? Well, Brad, now, if you knew Pamela, sweet Pamela, okay? She's not what I call a, a mega initiator, okay? Sweet Pamela, she says, um, she goes, yeah, Brad, um, you don't know this, but before I knew that we were going to have our office shut down, um, two months ago, I, I, uh, I knew our lease was going to be expiring. And I know you always want to save money for ministry, so um, I thought I'd surprise you. And I called KYCC Radio and asked them to put in a free PR announcement that we're looking for free office space. <laughs> and I'm looking at this going, that wasn't you. Because I know you. That was the Lord. And so I go, yes, we need office space. It's just how God moves. And on the radio stations, there were two. And they kept me on. And by God's grace, and actually Pastor Chuck, um, the, the, the Legal Edge was born. It was a commentary. I met with Pastor Chuck and early on. And I said, Pastor Chuck, he goes, yeah, Brad, so what's going on? I said, well, let me just tell you how we can serve the churches and the pastors, and here's all the things we do to help serve people without charge and, and ministers in, in Calvary chapels. We can do this and this. He goes, well, Brad, well, what do you want from me? And I guess he's used to people asking him for stuff, you know. And I said, well, I, I don't want anything. I mean, I could either 
talk to the you know hundreds and hundreds of Calvary chapels out there and sp spend countless hours. Or I can talk to you. I said, you're the grand poobah. If, I mean, <laughs> that's what I said. He was very gracious, you know. <laughs> and, um, and I said, you're the grand poobah. If something bad's happening out there, boom, you're going to find out about it. Boom, you send him to me, and I can take care of it. I saved myself tons of time. And he looks at me like this, and he goes, just stares at me like this. And he's staring at me. I'm thinking, okay, he's talking to God. So I said, in my pray I pray. I said, I said, okay, Lord, I know he's talking to you right now. Please put a good word in for me. <laughs> That's what I prayed. And he goes, Brad, do you have anything on the radio? I said, well, I'm a kid, you know, interviewed. He goes, no, no, your own thing. I said, no. He goes, we're going to take care of that. And Legal Edge was born, short commentary. And then later on, they approached me and they said, Brad, uh, do you want, you want to do a half hour radio show? I said, well, you know, we can't, I, we don't put money into media. He goes, no, no, no. If that's taken care of, could you do it? I said, yeah, yeah no problem. And so the Dacus Report was born. And then on his channel, you guys watch his channel ever? His channel? No? His channel, okay. So then I came in, anyway, his channel show was born. And they were going to be launching in a couple of months a new show called uh, Faith and Law. And it's going to be being debuted. And it's just how God works. And then fast forward, we now have not just one office in Sacramento, we now have offices all across the country, and it's exploded just in the last few years. Not because we want to grow, because I don't like growing. Um, you see, I'm not, God chose the wrong person, you know? I'm not the entrepreneur, right? I'm like, expansion, or no, no, don't expand. You know, more problems, more problems, more risk, more risk, avoid risk. But we had all these cases, and we had no choice but to expand and open an office here, open an office there. And uh, so Idaho, we opened an office even in Idaho. I was like, Idaho, that's supposed to be safe country. These, we got too many cases there. We need to open an office. And now we open in Nashville. And so we're all over the country, from Miami to Boston to Honolulu to Seattle to Dallas, Chicago, Denver. You know, just uh, it's what God does. And what's really exciting is when you realize in ministry is that it's not your baby. It's his baby. So much freedom. People say, bro, Brad, all those cases. We have over 150 cases in litigation. They say, Brad, I bet you're really stressed. I said, no, actually, I'm not. I'm that doesn't bother me because it's his baby and he's just doing a great job. And there's so much freedom that comes with that. So uh, let's get into the word and see, though, how we're supposed to deal with the challenges. Because today, uh, in the world we're living in, um, we're faced with tremendous challenges, aren't we? Yeah, yeah we are. Uh, historic proportions challenges and biblical proportions, in my opinion. So open if the word, if you would, to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Um, or you know what? Don't, don't bother. Just trust me. I'm a lawyer. That's good. You guys got that one. <laughs> I once did that to a congregation. There were no laughs. They just looked up and just started flipping, you know, faster. <laughs> it was funny. Okay. Uh, now, this is really uh, ex exciting time, 2 Timothy chapter 3, because first off, 2 Timothy is understood to be the last book written by the, by, by the Apostle Paul. And this is towards the last half of the last book He's writing, and he's about to die. He knows he's about to die. And he specifically, I believe, this passage in Scripture is written for us. And here's why, because chapter 3, verse 1. But know this, that in the last days, you might possibly have some uncomfortable, no. Um, in the last days, perilous times will come. It's going to be tough times, right? Yeah, there's, you know, sometimes we can get this illusion in our minds thinking that, oh, no, we're going to make it, it's, it's going to be a wonderful world. And, and, and it, no, read your scripture. It's perilous times will come in the last days. Uh, verse 2, for men will be lovers of themselves. Now, what do you call those, those pictures you take with your cell phone? Do you call them UEs? They's? No, it's what? Selfies. I'm just saying. Okay. Just saying. Um, maybe I'm reading too much into that. Uh, next is lovers of money. Lovers of money. We have very much a world that's very obsessed with money and wealth, isn't it? I felt so convicted by this verse. In fact, I sold one of my three yachts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't say that line in Newport Beach. Too close to home for some of them, probably. <laughs> Um, okay, but it's true. We're very materialistic. Boasters, boasters, right? Proud, proud. Pride is basically saying, what, that I'm, I'm, more, I'm more important than God. I, I do, can do my own thing. 
right? Um, blasphemers, right alongside that. When someone says, uh, this is my truth, basically what they're saying is, um, I'm my own God, right? Because if you're saying this is my truth, you're saying, well, wait a minute, then you're denying the absolute truth, the real truth, which is, you have, is from God. So we have all these people with this mindset that they become their own God. And it's really, they think it's very liberating because they can basically do whatever they want. But it's a lie. And it leads to death and destruction. Disobedient to parents. You know, when I saw this, I thought, yep, I had teenagers. How many have had teenagers before? Raise your hand. Okay. You know what I'm talking about. You're like, oh, this is, you know, what happened to my precious little daughter? You know, now she's like, the end of the world, you know. And uh, all, all that happens, you know, in adolescence. Um, but that's not what we're, t- we're really talking about here. It's not just kids, you know, finding their own independence and their own faith and their own personhood, you know, in that regard. Uh, that's a normal part of, of growing up. Uh, but no, what we're talking about here is, is disobedience, is turning from the teachings of their parents and their families and rebelling against the Lord. Uh, and that's very common. It's very common among the church. It's very common today. Uh, you know, you, you, you sort of have this impression sometimes that everyone has their act together. If you're a Christian family and you raise your kids according to the Lord and everything, that they're not going to rebel because you're a Christian home and you're doing everything God's word says. And I'm saying that is a deception. You know, I, I have, I'll be honest with you. Right now, one of my two kids, my son, is right now prodigal. He's rebelling. He's 20, just turned 21. My, my daughter is getting, getting ready next week to go on her fifth mission trip. And I have a son who's, who's rebelling against the Lord. The reason I share this is because I want you to pray for him. In fact, is we need to be open as believers. We need to seek, seek a prayer and intercession uh, for each other. My son, son's name is Austin. And uh, the reality is, this is not that uncommon. Uh, I was once uh, in, uh, in uh, Kansas City for a conference and I was going through this, this struggle in my mind, you know, with, with what my son was, you know, going through. And, and, um, and I, I was talking to some pastors. I started sharing with them. And they said, oh, yeah, yeah, my daughter. Da, da, da. Oh, yeah, my son went through. Yeah, my son, he's still rebelling. I'm like, wait a minute. You guys, I hear you on the radio, right? This is a, a big wedding for the, uh, the owner of Bot Radio. And so, and, and I'm looking at him thinking, like, wait a second. You guys are supposed to have your act together. I hear you on the radio. And one of them looked at me, looked over at me, and he says, you know, Brad, do you think God's a good father? I said, well, yeah, he's a perfect father. He goes, well, his first two didn't turn out so well. <laughs> Adam and Eve, if you have got that, okay, I guess you. <laughs> the fact is, 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 is that we live in a, a very uh, a turbulent world. And at the end of the day, it's a spiritual war. And, um, and we need to realize the spiritual war it's, it's, and, and, and what's involved. And this intensity is growing. Uh, in our society today, and uh, people uh, turning from their parents and turning from their teachings, and it's happening in historic proportions. Statistically, uh, people have left the faith, uh, the younger generation, and historic proportions have left the faith. Oftentimes, they'll, they'll leave their faith, they'll go to college, then they get married, have kids, and they go back to the faith. But the studies show that that's not happening. And instead, they're going a different way, a way of darkness and a way of rebellion. So... Um, blasphemers, disobedient parents, unthankful. What's the synonym for unthankful? Entitled. Is that a word we've heard much of? Entitlements, entitled. Yeah, yeah. It's it's very much in our society. I was once I was buying my car, and the car dealer says, says, well, you know, you deserve this, and I just it just sort of a reflex. I said, no, no, I deserve hell. And he, he looked at me like. <laughs> And I hear, I mean, no, I, and then I explained to him, but, you know, I said, but I'm, you know. Anyway, probably not the best, uh, smoothest <laughs> way of sharing the gospel, but. But the attitude of entitlement, what is this entitlement? No, unthankful. What we deserve is death. Thanks, thanks, glory be to God for his grace and mercy upon all of us. We're all sinners, all have fallen short. Unholy, unholy is being separate from God, who is holy and complete. And we're, we deviate from him. We're unholy, unloving, unforgiving, right? We don't have a, our, our nation has been known for being a nation of forgiveness and mercy. Someone blows it, but they say, look, you know, hey, I blew it. I'm sorry. I was wrong, da, da, da. We forgive. We, as a nation, we often forgive. 
um, I see much less of that for willingness to forgive and much less willingness to acknowledge uh, wrong uh, to begin with. Slanderers, slanderers without self-control, without self-control. Growing up, I remember I would hear, you know, well, you know, self-control, you know, uh, don't eat your dessert till you, you know, finish your, your, your spinach. I hated boiled spinach, I'm just telling you. Liver, okay. I, my childhood, I need to have regressive therapy, no. Um, but no, but, but you know, you, you, I, I learned, no, you, you delayed gratification, you, you have self-control. Um, just because you want to do something doesn't mean you should. But what do we, t- what do we learn in our society today? Well, what's uh, your effect? We're all programmed. We're all brainwashed. I'm going to say a few a few words, and you're going to automatically know what the next words are. If it feels good, do it. don't. That's right. No, no, do it. Right? Nike. That's that's Nike right there. I mean, you know, um, and that's a part of our thinking. It's a part of our society. The spies are traitors. Traitors. You know, uh, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. It's interesting, I, when I hear that, I was thinking, uh, you know, lovers of pleasure are lovers of God. What does that mean, you know? And, and yet we saw it really clearly in a, the Supreme Court case uh, dealing with marriage. And uh, the Supreme Court, in their majority opinion, bare majority opinion, ruled five to four that, um, that, uh, that same-sex marriage is protected by the Constitution and they use the Equal Protection Clause. And I says, OK, I get it. You know, Equal Protection Clause, gender discrimination, you'd be able to choose whatever gender you All right, I don't agree with it, but that's what I was expecting uh, from the other side. But you know what they did? They did something very abominable. They, they said, oh, and there's a second reason. There's a fundamental right for individual sexual fulfillment. And that, um, I look at that and says, wait a minute, this is so broad. This is, I'm reading it through going, whoa, this opens a floodgate. And then I read the dissenting opinion by Justice Roberts. Chief, and he, this was, he was on the right side on this one. And he says basically the same thing. He goes, this opens a floodgate, to paraphrase. All kinds of stuff. This is not in the Constitution. But the majority left it in, because they look at each other's opinions before they're final on their opinions. They send them back and forth. The majority knew exactly what they were doing. And now we've got all kinds of of hideous things taking place that you guys know about. I need to go into details. You guys know about it. Um, and, it's, and, it's, and it's basically, and the, the Supreme Court in that decision basically took their fist, they shook it at God, and said, we'd rather be lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of you. And we've now seen the, the fruits of that unraveling before our eyes. Um, Having a form of godliness, but, but denying its power. I always thought, what does that mean? When I was a kid reading the Bible, having a form of godliness, but denying it, what is that? What is that? And I was on an airplane. And by the way, you know those people who talk on airplanes, and you wish they'd be quiet? They're like, rah, rah, rah. OK, I'm the one right here, right here. <laughs> and by the way, I think I'm losing my hearing, because I'm talking louder and louder as I'm getting older. I mean, several people, several aisles up, come and say, oh, I think that was such a good thing you said, you know, or whatever. Um, <laughs> but I'm on this plane trip, and I was talking to this gentleman, and, and, uh, and I just, it's, planes are great places to, to evangelize, because, I mean, what are they going to do? You know, <laughs> you know, all the seats are filled. Are you going to jump out? I don't think so, you know? So I sit next to him, and I said, so, uh, so tell me, you mind me asking, do you have any faith background or religion background? And he and just, you know, just I went with the flow, and, it, and he goes, uh, "No, I'm not very. I know I'm not religious, but I am very spiritual. spiritual. We know it. <laughs> Lucifer is using the same line, the, the, the deceiver. And so I thought, well, I'm an attorney. I'm going to cross-examine him. <laughs> so I said, really? So, um, so what do you, so what do you mean by um, spiritual? He goes, well, I really. This is so typical." I just really feel at peace with the universe. I said, OK, and, and what else? He goes, that's it. What is that? That's nothing. It's like a feeling. 
It's like a vapor. It's like a cloud. There's nothing to it. And yet, what has God given us as Christians, as believers? He's given us the word of God. Two-thirds of the prophecy has, prophets, prophecy has already come to pass. It's so reliable, so dependable, the word of God. He's given us a what also? He's also given us validation of the most important question, did Jesus rise from the dead? And it is so compelling because he didn't have just one witness. He had not two witnesses. You had a dozen witnesses. No, you had actually 500 seen him risen from the dead. And this was backed up. There's about uh, over 30 historians at the time. About half of them were non-believers who validated that these disciples, these people lived, that they validated that they saw Jesus risen from the dead, and they gave their lives for their testimony that they saw Jesus risen from the dead. I mean, I'm just thinking, if that was a modern-day trial, I'd say, Your Honor, I like a motion for summary judgment. There's no disputed issues of fact here. Um, and yet that's God's given us. And then a third thing he's given us as believers is his word, the evidence of his resurrection, and the third is the testimony of the transformation. How many of either themselves or know of someone who's been transformed by the work of God through faith in Christ? Raise your hand. Oh, very good. Very good. So we have that, or we have this form of godliness, but no power. Nothing that got, you know, and we have a powerful God with real faith that's proven itself and it's proving itself in, our, in the past and in the present. Then it says, uh, and from such people turn away. Turn away? We're supposed to turn away from, wait, no, no, are we supposed to evangelize these people? What we're talking about here is people who have, are invading the church. That's what we're talking about. How do we know that? Because it says, like, verse 6 through through nine, I'll just read it through quickly. It says, for of this sort are those who creep into households and make captives of gullible women loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. These are people who they, they, hear, they hear the Bible, they hear the word, but they're not able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Uh, now as Janus and Jambres uh, resisted Moses, so do those who resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds disapproved concerning the faith, uh, but they will progress no further for their folly will be manifest to all as theirs also was. So we're going to see this happening. Do we see this happening in the church today? Any kind of heresy happening in the denominations? Yeah. When I was a boy, there were two kinds of, there were two kinds of Christians, right? Um, you had those, well, you had two kinds of people. You had those who, who were Christians and went to church and you had those who were knowing that they should be going to church. You know, like, oh, Pastor, Pastor Bud, sorry about that. I had one brisky too many last night, but next Sunday I'll be there. Right? That kind of mindset. And now we have a different world where you have followers of Jesus and you have those who hate and despise followers of Jesus who look at the church as a symbol of hate and everything that they disagree with. It's a different world we live in. Uh, we have denominations splitting right down the middle, not over whether you dunk or you sprinkle. I thought that was a big issue as a child. The dunkers, I knew they were going to heaven. The sprinklers, I'm not so sure. I'm just saying. <laughs> that was my thinking as a child, okay? But now what's the issue? It says, your, does your church believe in the holy word of God and that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through faith in Jesus? Or do they believe something else? And it's, that's what we see happening in our world today. Now, if, this, if the scripture stopped right here at verse 9, that'd be a real shame because we'd all be like, well, I guess that's just what we're going to have to go through. We're just going to be all, okay, here's the good news. Verse 10 starts with the blueprint of victory. So awesome that God in his grace didn't just leave it there and say, this is what's going to happen, so, you know, all the best. No, verse 10, we get the, the, the blueprint. It says, but 10, verse, it says, starts with it. It says, but you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long suffering. Oh, oh, okay, the other ones I like just fine. <laughs> but long suffering? You know what long suffering is? It's long <laughs> suffering. It's not short inconvenience. It's long suffering. And then 
It's followed by love after perseverance and persecutions and afflictions. Love? How do you stick love in there? We have long-suffering, persecution, and affliction. Do you stick love? Is that possible for us to love when we have long-suffering, persecution, and afflictions? By ourselves, no, it's not. It's not. But with the Lord, yes, it is. And you know, as believers, that's one of the most powerful parts of our testimony. The more we're persecuted, the more long-suffering, the more afflictions and persecutions, the more we resonate with the love of Christ. And the world doesn't understand it. You know, with the recent pandemic, uh, fear was overtaking the country. Now, whether you're vaccinated or not vaccinated, not the issue, okay? You can listen to my radio show if you want more on that. Okay, no. But um, that's not the issue. But the issue was the, that I'm talking about is the fear that just consumed, consumed our country. And in California, I know we'd be in the as, you know, neighborhood, suburban neighborhood. There'd be someone out there jogging in their jogging outfit with a mask on. I'm like, why are you wearing a mask? You're outside jogging. There's, there's no one around. And, and there are people in, in cars with their masks on, windows rolled up. And I thought, how stupid. And then my wife said, once said, uh, honey, could you, t- you want to take your mask off here in the car? I go, oh, that's right, I forgot. So I realize some people, and we just forget, you know, forget we don't need to have it in the car. But fear just gripped this country. And it's, it was a, to me, it was a, a spiritual testing in a way of our nation. Because he has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and discipline. And I could just see people who do not know, do not know the Lord were consumed with fear, fear of death, paranoia. And over here, we had believers. And it st- stood out. How many noticed the difference? Can you have somebody just noticed the difference? Yeah. I noticed the difference. And, uh, and the world noticed the difference, too. Um, also, I know sometimes when we're wronged, uh, this is real important. Once someone wronged me, and I was so angry. And this person was a you know, believer, but weak believer, you know, weak believer, but he wronged me big time. And I was like, I was all ready to dice and slice him with the word of God. Oh, I was gonna, he was going to feel like dirt after I was done quoting the scriptures to him. Now, did I have a good heart? Was that the right attitude? Was there any love there? No. So I thought, I should, I should pray before I go in. So I start, I pray for him. I pray for it. And then the Holy Spirit starts to show me how God sees him, which is someone who's hurt and someone who is wounded. And so I get in there and I start talking to him. I says, hey, how, how are you doing? How are things going for you? How are you doing? And as I started watering, he says, I wronged you worse than anyone, Brad. And you care about how I'm doing? I said, well... In all honesty, it's really not me. Because before I prayed, I had some other things I was going to say. But when I prayed for you before I came in, I realized how God showed me how much he loves you and how much he wants to heal you. And that's not, that's not me. That's not my flesh. That's the power of God and the spirit of love and the, and the power that, ha- that takes place when we have all this stuff surrounding us, long-suffering persecutions, afflictions. Which happened to me going back to verse 11, at Antioch, at Iconum, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all, the Lord delivered me. Whoa, 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 Paul, uh, uh, time out. Hey, buddy, I know you were the guy that got shipwrecked and like, almost like stoned to death. Some theologians say you were killed and then came back, uh, bitten by a snake. I mean, whipped, scourged, prisoned. The Lord delivered you? And notice, it doesn't say that he prevented the persecutions, but he brought Paul through it. And his testimony was all the more powerful all along the way. And the, and the evidence of Christ, all the more powerful. Can you imagine how much weaker his testimony would have been if he had been a preacher and he had this huge, gigantic ministry and owned a large mansion house overlooking the Mediterranean on one of the most elitist islands of Greece? Would it be that compelling, like, No, as opposed to suffering what he did. The evidence was all the more compelling. But by the way, if you do have a mansion on an island in Greece and you want to have a week or two there, just talk to me afterwards. I mean, I I don't mind that. I don't mind. So the Lord delivers us. Now, verse 12, you say, well, does this apply to us? This applies to Paul. But, well, verse 12, yes. It says, yes. And all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus 
will suffer persecution. Now, one reason why we may not be suffering persecution is because, you know, living godly is being open about our faith, right? Not hiding our faith. And sometimes may, may not know we're Christians. Ask yourself this question. In work, how many people know that you're a Christian versus how many people who don't know that you're a Christian? Just ask yourself that question. They should know you're a believer. Eventually, you know, you don't have to pound them over the head, you know. Are you a Christian? Well, I'm a Christian, you know. But, but having your testimony and having it open. Now, some of you say to yourselves, well, um, well, you see, I, I don't have it all together because the other day our earnings were really low and I said a few words that I shouldn't have said and so I don't want to look like I'm a hypocrite. Oh, Satan loves that one. Because remember, you, your testimony is not how you have arrived to holiness and perfection, right? It's how you've been justified through faith in Christ. And the, and the process is sanctification. You know, my wife will, will attest to the fact, I have a long way to go, okay? I mean, I look my best behind a pulpit. Actually, that's how I, I got her as my wife, by the way. Um, <laughs> and then she married me, found out, no, he's, he's, he's not sorry, so perfect, but... But the point is, our testimony is not how we have arrived, but it's what God, by his grace and mercy, has done for us and what he's doing through us. And that hope that then you can share with others, that God takes all of us right where we are. Verse 13. But evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Boy, do we see that, right? So so widespread, it's the, the, those deceiving, do, you know, uh, in verse 14, but you, you must continue in the things which you've learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you learned them. By the way, who is he talking about? He's talking about being learning from people who are eyewitnesses to Jesus and his resurrection and the teachings, something reliable, something that that's, that's, you can count on. Verse 15, and that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Scripture is, is so valuable. And I love you said childhood. One thing I liked about the church I grew up in, I grew up in a Baptist church as a boy, and we were real big into Bible verse memorization. And we get like points, and if you get points, you can buy different things. I didn't like any of the, the toys, so it didn't really help me in that regard. But I memorized Bible verse, Bible verse, Bible verse. You know what's interesting about Bible verse memorization? a study came out, a secular study, and it said that IQ is pretty constant. What you're born with is what you've got. But they said there's one exception to that. Studies have found that children who memorize actually increase their IQ. And that's why I'm so smart. No, no, don't. <laughs> no. I never made the Metal Gifted Minds program, so I can't say that. But, uh, but memorizing the Word of God, not just memorizing, but it's also the Word and even if a child doesn't understand it, God brings it to mind. How many of you ever had that happen, where the Lord brings, has brought to you a mind, a Bible verse you memorized as a child, and, and it, it really convicted you when you needed that, that conviction? Raise your hand. Anyone ever had that happen? Yeah. God does that. Now, how reliable is Scripture? Um, verse 16 and 17, if you don't like absolutes, you're going to hate these two verses. Tons of absolute wordage. It says, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Why? Verse 17, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So is this pretty important? Yeah, yeah it's very important. You know, as believers, I'll have to be honest with you. We can sometimes become religious about reading the Word of God. Maybe you know what I'm talking about. When I was younger, I mean, I was religious. I read my chapter every day. Now, sometimes I was late. I was like, oh, I've got to get to school or something. I gotta... So I was like, oh, okay, I better hurry and read. Okay, but no, this is the last day's prayer. I said, what did you just read? I said, I don't know. I was too busy reading. <laughs> I mean, come on. How, we do that, right? Our minds drift while we're reading. If you ask us this, to share just one thing that, that God and his word said, you just go, blah, blah, I don't know. Because we're going through it as a ritual, as if we're somehow paying penance. We don't do that. It's not a penance thing. It's a relationship thing. Relationship thing is when your heart's wanting to listen, right? 
It's real important. Um, and so it's like when I, we got married, my wife discovered this about men. She would start talking to me, and I'd be watching a show on television. You ladies know what I'm talking about. She'd say, honey, so we're going to da 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 I go, yeah, uh-huh, yeah, yeah, uh-huh, yeah. Oh, yeah, uh-huh. Yeah, you want me to jump off a bridge? No problem. Yeah, you know. No. But she realized I'm going through the motions, but I'm not really giving her the attention because as a man, I'm linear. I mean, that's just how we are. Ladies, if you haven't got married yet, you'll find that out. We're, our brains function differently. I have to focus and give my attention. That's what God wants with his word. And if it, but that means we only read a couple of Bible verses instead of a chapter, then so be it. But let those Bible verses be ones where we're really saying, Lord, speak to me with this scripture. Help me to meditate on you and your scripture. Because it's about communing with God, not just going through the, the ritual of doing a certain thing so we can be self-proud in our own good Christianity. Like, see, I do this, I do this, I do this. And it's like, that's not what a relationship is. It's about spending time with God. Uh, chapter 4, verse 1. I charge you, therefore, before God. Now, why are you saying therefore? Well, going back, because he's given us the scripture. He's given us the word, the, the testimony, the, the, you know, the eyewitnesses. So he says, I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Well, what's he going to charge us with? This is pretty heavy, right? What is it? Verse 2. Preach the word. It doesn't say be comfortable. Because <laughs> that's often our society, our culture, is be comfortable. Christ is, you know, comfort Christianity. No. Preach the, we say, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Now, what's he talking about? Like in the winter versus the summer? Or no? What he's talking about here is in season when it's, you see things going. And you see people coming to Jesus, and you see the harvest, and it's awesome. And out of season, when you don't see the harvest, and you see rejection. Um, in Acts chapter 22, if you want to read an example, many times we think of Apostle Paul preaching and everyone coming to Jesus, and you know, um, reality. And actually, in, uh, in um, Acts chapter 22, um, you know, Paul talks about he's preaching and they want to, they're tearing off their clothes, throwing dust in the air, and they want to scourge the guy. So that was not, that was an out of season, but Paul still was faithful to preach the word as we are to be as well. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all, here it comes again, long suffering and teaching. Verse three, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because of they, they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Whoa. Historic proportions we see this happening in the world today. We see it happening. It doesn't take God by surprise. And by the way, don't get anxious when you see this stuff on TV and all this stuff happening as if like some strange thing's happening. It's like, you know, none of this is taking God by surprise. And he was gracious. He said, you know what? In fact, I'm going to let you know ahead of time what's coming. So don't be, like, anxious. You know, it's uh, God, God wins, right? Everything is going to come to pass. This is a part of the prophecy, I believe. Verse 5. But you be watchful in all things. In other words, don't keep our head in the sand either. Sometimes we can say, I don't want to watch the news. I don't watch this. I don't want to... I just wanted to say, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. You know, just stay up here in the clouds. No, be watchful in all things. We should be aware of things. By the way, which reminds me, um, you guys should have gotten one of these, these sign-up sheets. That's one way of being, being watchful is you fill this out, we'll keep you updated with our cases. Um, be watchful. Why? Because we, God wants us to be watchful and to pray, right? To be spiritual warriors. Um, it's so important for us to be interceding. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. Now, here, of course, we're talking to pastors, right? Because so, pastor, fulfill your ministry. Do the work of an evangelist. And then we're supposed to cheer him on like, no, no. No, no, no. He's talking to all of us. Now, some of you say, well, um, <laughs> you don't understand this, Brad. See, I don't have a ministry. I'm, I'm, just, I'm not gifted. I'm just 
It's just not me. I don't, God can't use me. Let me tell you a little story, brief story. There was a boy who was 16 years old, and he was driving to school one day on a Texas highway, and he was a Christian. He'd given his life to Christ, and he was driving a little Opal GT to school, to high school, and on a, on a country highway, and a, and a motorcycle was passing cars and hit him head on as he went up a hill in the boy's lane. And the motorcycle went smashing through the window and smashed through his skull. It's very gruesome. I just ruined your lunch, didn't I? So, <laughs> so it smashed through the window, smashed through the skull. It was crushed. The jaw was disconnected, brain damage. You know, he was rushed to one hospital and then to Parkland General Hospital and in intensive care, and his parents were told, uh, your son has had major brain damage. Even if he lives, he still could be a vegetable. You may still have to pull the cord, end quote. Can't get much worse than that. As far as the world was concerned, this boy and his future was over in the trash. And yet, our God is a great recycler. He loves to take that which the world throws away and do something new. And that's what he did with this this young boy. This young boy experienced a miraculous healing um, of the brain. In fact, uh, he went on using that left frontal lobe, uh, which was logic, reasoning, analytical thinking, and got a a, a degree with honors in finance at Texas A&M University. Put himself through one of the top 20 law schools in the country. And I know this kid really well. Because if you haven't guessed it yet, it's me. And um, so this all has been reconstructed, this whole left side of my face. I have a plate here and put a hip bone grafting on my cheek. And re- I really messed up that song, didn't I? The, you know, the hip bones connected. OK, never mind. <laughs> I thought I'd help you connect. But God did an inc- incredible work. And some of you may be saying, oh, verily, verily, for he is the Lord's special. No, 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 no. Talk to my wife. She'll tell you my halo is still really crooked, OK? He didn't heal me because I earned it. He earned it because of his grace and his mercy, and uh, because of who he was. And that same power is there to work in each and every one of us. The key is is for us to recognize it's not about us. It's not about what we bring to the table. (laughs) It's It's all about him. It's not about who we are. It's about whose we are and being open to how God wants to work through us in whatever way. Uh, and we, we can't limit God. I remember we, uh, as a woman, she was my, my adopted grandma, if you will. We celebrated Christmas together in Sacramento, and she was a widow, and um, she loved the Lord. But uh, as she was getting along, uh, she became basically blind. She could, I mean, she couldn't see. And she said to me, she says, you know, I just want to die. I says, I can't do anything for the Lord now. I just want to die. I says, are you kidding? Because you're blind now, you have the ability to to focus and intercede in prayer for people like never before, to be a spiritual warrior like never before. She goes, you're right. I'm going to start engaging in concentrated spiritual warfare and intercession. And she did. And finally, she said to me, she said after several months, she goes, you know, Brad, my mind just isn't allowing me to focus anymore. I said, can you say Abba? Can you say Father? She goes, yeah, I can do that. I said, say that. Just say that. Just acknowledge him. Because he's like, you know how, how happy we are when our, our two-year-old, two-and-a-half-year-old, or so one they walk, two they talk. OK, here we go. Two-year-old, and they go for the first time, da-da. Do we say, that's it? <laughs> really? No. We go, awesome. He said, da-da, not mama, da-da. <laughs> Because dad comes first. For, don't be discouraged, mother. It's usually dad does first. You're ecstatic. Why? Just because he acknowledged you, right? That's how our father is when we acknowledge him, right? Just like, just like that little, our little dog. He's just ecstatic. He spends the whole day waiting for me to come home. And when I come home, he's ecstatic just to be, spend time with me. And then he wants to be close to me. And, just, and I just thought, boy, God, make me like this little dog. I never thought I'd say that. <laughs> Maybe like this little dog, the way he is to me, I want to be that way to you. So, so let him fulfill that ministry. Be open to what it is. And uh, be willing to share your testimony. Verse 6, for I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. 
and the time of my departure is at hand. He's being eloquent here, but what he's basically saying is, I'm about to die, okay? They're about to kill me. Verse 7, as he says, woe is me, for I, no, no, he didn't say that at all. Verse 7, he says, he says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Isn't this encouraging to see that this standard is one all of us can have? Notice he didn't say, I saw a thousand people come to Jesus. I established 10 churches. He didn't say that. Because first off, those are results things, and results are God's baby, right? Paul didn't take credit for any of that. It's like, no, that's, that's, if God's worthy of all glory and all praise, then he's worthy of all credit for all results, right? So what's the issue here is one of obedience. Basically he's saying, hey, I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I kept the faith. I kept going. And then verse 8 is our final verse. It says, finally. He's gone through a lot. So that word finally means a lot. Finally. There is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who've loved his appearing. Now, first off, let's go back a little bit. Uh, the crown of righteousness with the Lord as the righteous judge will give me on that day. <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. Paul. <laughs> I know your name used to be Saul. I know that you used to be the Osama bin Laden of the early church. You were the nightmare. There was a reason no one invited you to a Wednesday night scripture day, Right? <laughs> You were prisoning. You put people in prisons, men and women, and persecuted. You are going to get the crown of righteousness? Yes. Not because of what Paul did, but because of what Jesus did on the cross for Paul. And it was by God's grace. In fact, if God, in fact he was the one who, who interrupted him on the way to Damascus. That's scripture. Notice Paul didn't do anything to deserve that intervention. It's all grace. God's love, taking us right where we are. And by the way, does that crown of righteousness apply to us? And the answer is yes, because it says, we'll give to me and on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Now, that's interesting, because my background, I think, is for all people who maybe said a certain prayer, or, or maybe they were religious, maybe went to confirmation, or went to confession a lot, or maybe tithed a lot, but this is an issue, it's not no, it's an issue of the heart who loved his appearing. So let me just give you a hypothetical. Now, no one knows when Jesus is coming, the day or the hour. But let's just say hypothetically that we know that Jesus was going to be coming tomorrow at exactly 2.30 p.m. Central Time. Okay? We know it. It's a fact. If that was the case, what would you be thinking and feeling right now? He's coming tomorrow at 2.30 the rapture is going to happen. No one knows the day in the hour. I get that. Okay. What would you be thinking and feeling? Would it be, oh, shoot, I've got a real estate deal closing at three. <laughs> is that possible? Or I'm about to move into my new home or whatever. Or even more likely, is it possibly, are you going to be thinking, oh, shoot, I don't know if he's going to take me. Because I know I've been to church. I've done religious things and all. But... I've got this dark closet that no one knows about. And by the way, for the record, we all have dark closets. We all have shame, right? But you say to yourself, but my shame is different. This shame is so bad, how can God forgive me for this? Because I can't even forgive myself. You know what we're really saying to the Lord when we say that? It's like walking up to Jesus on the cross, and there he is on the cross. Just pretend he's on the cross right there, dying for our sins. And we walk up to him, and there he is, gasping for breath in pain and agony, bleeding on the cross. And we say, nice try, Jesus. But you see, for me, that's just not good enough. And on the cross, I think he responded to that lie very well when he said, it is finished. And all we have to do, saints, is to believe it and receive it. And he will separate that sin as far as the east is from the west. That's the kind of Savior we have, full and complete. 
but we have to put our trust in him and, and no longer in our religion, no longer in our, our works, no longer in what we can do or making up for what we've done. It's putting it totally in faith in Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. And he can make us a new creation, a new creature. And we can enter into a relationship with a God who is unconditional in his love and his relationship with us and wanting to transform us if we, as we surrender our lives to him, truly, truly surrender our lives to him. Um, there may be someone here today, as I shared that, and you felt convicted, pierced in the heart, thinking that's me. That's not Brad talking. That's probably the Holy Spirit giving you the opportunity right now to receive Jesus.